Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, I hope you enjoyed morning tea, and I hope you all <laughs> consumed a uh, responsible amount of caffeine. Before we commence our next session, it gives me great pleasure to welcome back to the stage my super clever friend, Frankie, Policy Manager, Sustainability and Regulatory Affairs at the Property Council of Australia to launch an important new social sustainability report. Please make her very welcome. Thanks, Thanks Mike. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted to be up here this morning in front of all of you to launch this. Uh, there, there's a couple of copies around, so please look out for them. Uh, look, we are launching uh, a common language for social sustainability today. Um, this is the result of collective efforts of uh, my National Social Sustainability Committee. A few of you are here today. So up front, I, I really just want to acknowledge the input of a lot of members that, that worked really hard to pull this together, so thank you. Um, so what are we talking about here? Well, as we've kind of just heard over the last couple of days, the built environment has always shaped the lives of people. And as we've discussed over the last couple of days, it's also an incredibly powerful force for social change. Whether that's the design of our homes and the places that we go to work to make them accessible and, and you know, puts physical and mental well-being first, uh, to using the procurement power of the industry to tackle issues like modern slavery uh, and, you know, really empower social enterprises and businesses that are delivering both economic but also social outcomes for their communities. Um, and, and that goes right the way through to harnessing the power of this industry's very powerful connection to land to progress uh, the movement towards reconciliation and closing the gap. So what do we even mean by social sustainability? I, I just hosted a, a really fabulous panel in here where we you know, looked at um, cultural appreciation in, in public spaces. We looked at green infrastructure. We looked at healthcare for indoor environment quality and putting patient health um, first. Social sustainability is this nebulous kind of concept that encompasses you know, a lot of really important things and things that we're talking about now they're things that we've been moving on in some areas and probably not enough in other areas. So it's essentially the people part of the, of the triple bottom line. It's the combination of uh, design in the physical realm with the design of the social world and the social infrastructure to support cultural life, social amenities, systems for citizen engagement and spaces for people um, to evolve. So we felt there wasn't one resource or one place you could go that, that told you that, that, that broke down some of the jargon around what this all means and what this industry's role, in, uh, role is for social sustainability. So that's what we've done uh, with this document. So we've, we've sought to break down a lot of the concepts encompassed in this nebulous uh, social sustainability term. Um, we've, uh, we've done that kind of bringing them under five key areas. So that's uh, culture and community, health and well-being, mobility and access, equity and fair trade, as well as those economic outcomes I spoke about. And, and I'll, be, I'll be really upfront. We're not saying this is an exhaustive guide that gives you the, the comprehensive list of what best practice means. This is a conversation starter for our industry. So we want to add to this. I want your input. Um, it's about driving the broader discussion within, dis within the industry, making it accessible, and starting to normalize some you know, really exciting projects that represent best practice currently. So when you go through the document, and I said there's a few copies there, uh, it's on our website at the moment. Uh, in each category, we break down some of the concepts, and I think the, the real sort of hero content in this report uh, are the stories that, that come with it. And I think um, I was chatting to a few people this morning. Tim Gartrell's uh, presentation yesterday really hit home for me. I think I get caught up um, you know, in my role trying to talk about really technical concepts to, to politicians and ministers' advisors. And at times, you can lose sight of what are the real stories on the ground and the way that you know, all of that really important policy actually translates into you know, outcomes in people's lives. 
So that's another example of some of the case studies. So I'd, I'd really encourage you to go and have a look at those. So as I said, um, this, is, this is our conversation starter. Uh, we're really hoping that you'll engage with this, read it, come to us with ideas or you know, projects that you're involved in. The next step for our committee, and they're a really impassioned bunch that want to see this um, sort of conversation go more broadly, is, is starting to address uh, some of the issues that have been brought up in the last uh, couple of days. So how, how do you quantify the, the benefit of these measures? We, we all know that uh, designing places with green infrastructure or with people in mind brings about a lot of you know, benefits in terms of productivity, in terms of people's mental health, all of these sorts of things. How do we start to quantify that? Well, that's, that's the next challenge for this group. So we're gonna be looking at establishing some common metrics and, and if we can then agree that as an industry, we ought to be you know, focusing our collective efforts on a, on a few important areas and start to benchmark progress in that, and we can attribute value to that and we'll hopefully, our great hope is, that will, that will drive further action in those areas. So that's all I wanted to say uh, this morning. Uh, it's live on our website now. We have uh, some, uh, only a few hard copies. So if you'd, if you'd like one, please come and see me. I've got some at the table here. Um, please look at it on the website. Please tweet about it. Uh, we, we want the social media com uh, conversation to continue. So thank you so much. Well, thank you very much again, Frankie, and more strength to your arm as you continue to make sustainability great again. And speaking of great, ladies and gentlemen, our next session is sponsored by our major sponsor, Stockland. Before we commence, we have a short video featuring Davina Rooney, General Manager of Sustainability at Stockies, but so much more. Uh, Davina is one of the Green Building Council's greatest and truest champions uh, and it's a great pleasure to hear from her as she discusses what actions the sustainability industry needs to take to energise communities. At Lancome we see an energised community as a place where people come together. They're out and about on the streets, they're using the places that we've created. So you've picked up your coffee from the Social Enterprise Cafe, you've walked your kids down to the park at the end of your street, and then you can let your dog off in the dog park that we've created. It's about people coming together and being proud of where they live. A great example we have at Lancome is the Social Corner at Green Square, where we've created a multi-use cafe so you can pick up a great coffee, set up your remote working hub, or come to a community event that we've put on for everyone. It's where people can connect. That's why energised communities are an integral part of our sustainability approach at Lancome. Well, you see what I did there, don't you? I used one of Tim Gartrell's techniques to really contrast something that you're expecting with what you actually got, and we really just wanted to <laughs> emphasise how great it was to have all our young Indigenous leaders here uh, again, and thank you, Lancome, for that. And Davina, we're going to find your slot and we're going to give it a good thorough run through. Luckily, I praised you so heavily beforehand. Otherwise, that might have looked like some sort of, you know, modest bump on the smooth highway of green cities. Um, I am now delighted, I am truly delighted, to introduce our next session heading towards the horizon. I'm going to exit the stage down this way so as to avoid looking Ken in the eye after I say this, but it is going to feature a long-form spoken word duet between two exquisite minds. To kick us off, please welcome to the stage our first exquisite mind, Property Council Chief, Ken Morrison. Uh, thanks very much, Mike. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, in 2014, our next guest convinced his leader to not just create a city's portfolio, uh, but also to give it to him. Since then, debates over cities and infrastructure and population have cantered along, and the two occurrences are certainly not unrelated. Anthony Albanese is both a deep policy thinker and a fierce and effective communicator. That's a powerful combination. In government, he created Infrastructure Australia, established the Big Australia Fund, formed the Major Cities Unit, and led seminal work on aviation, freight, and many other things. From opposition, Anthony has led debates over cities and infrastructure, 
Uh, today, he's going to provide us with a few thoughts and some opening remarks, and then we'll move to a, a conversation and a Q&A session. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome former Deputy Prime Minister, Shadow Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Cities and Regional Development, and my local member, Anthony Albanese. Thanks very much, Ken. A, a reminder that all politics is local. Um, I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of country and pay my respect to their elders past and present. Um, not all years are remarkable, but 2008 certainly was. In that year, we watched in trepidation as Lehman Brothers and other financial institutions collapsed, triggering the global financial crisis. The nation paused as Kevin Rudd on the first day of the new parliament gave an apology to the stolen generations. And in the United States, many of us cheered on as Barack Obama became the first African-American to be elected as its president. It's no wonder, perhaps, that one world event sidled past, uh, largely uncommented upon. It certainly wasn't the fact that I was the first ever infrastructure minister. It was the fact that for the first time, more of the world's population lived in cities than in rural areas. A trajectory that's significant because just a decade on, it has surged ahead. The world is on track for 70% of the world's population to be living in our cities by 2050. Countries around the world are grappling with urbanisation. And here in Australia, all of our capital cities are projected to experience a significant rise in urban population between now and 2031. Projections are that by then, the population of the four largest capitals, uh, Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane on the East Coast and Perth, will have increased by some 46%. Adelaide, Canberra, Hobart and Darwin are expected to grow by 30%. Many of our cities are already feeling the pinch of urbanisation. Urban sprawl, congested roads, overcrowded public transport, declining housing affordability and an unequal distribution of employment opportunities are just a few of the challenges experienced every day by people living in our cities. To make matters worse, these factors combined have taken a toll on our natural environment. And at the same time, they also pose a threat to public health through an increase in pollution and the subsequent loss of green space as a result of badly planned urban development. On the one hand, cities are the engine room of our nation's economy. They are places of opportunity and hope for many people seeking prosperity and advancement. But on the other hand, our cities can both have an impact on climate change, which in turn impacts back on our cities. Cities may cover less than 2% of the Earth's surface. However, they consume 78% of the world's energy and produce more than 60% of all carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions. And that's why greening our cities goes beyond the aesthetic. It is an absolutely fundamental part of our response as a nation to the challenge of climate change. As urbanist Jane Jacobs has said, there is no logic that can be superimposed on the city. People make it and it is to them, not buildings that we must fit our plans. And that's why I welcome uh, conferences such as this, where policymakers and people in business gather to work out how we can proceed through in a way that benefits at the end of the day, what matters, which is people. This is a good reminder that in our haste to respond to a growing urban population, we also can't forget those communities that already exist. After all, these people will be most impacted by any change. And that's why the theme of today's conference, energising communities, is so important. The fact is that without all of us, our local communities included, working together towards greener cities, achieving this goal becomes so much harder. Just these last few weeks, there's been a great deal of media coverage about livability in our major cities, 
following the release of Infrastructure Australia's Future Cities report. Here in Melbourne, The Age has looked at the challenge of the daily commute for people living in outer suburbs. In Sydney, the Sydney Morning Herald has canvassed reasons why people leave the city, with their research revealing that locals are moving to other parts of Australia. This in itself isn't a bad thing. Indeed, growing our regional cities must be part of any national strategy to accommodate an increasing population and ensure a more equal distribution of the economic dividends from this growth. However, one researcher for the Herald described this phenomenon as such. Sydney siders, as they move out of this place, haven't given up on city living, they've just given up on this city. Now, this is of concern, real concern. The fact is that our cities are in a state of change and how we respond will make all the difference. It's a serious responsibility that we have, but also a unique opportunity for local government policymakers and industry to leave their mark and create a positive legacy. So people don't think that moving away from cities like Sydney or Melbourne is the only way to have true quality of life. Best practice must be at the heart of any strategy. We need to make sure that development in our inner and our outer suburbs reflects an understanding of how people live. This means well-placed development that incorporates access to amenities like public transport, so that people can get to work as well as to parks and sporting facilities for kids so they can be active and healthy. It means development that has thought about local road networks and the impact that additional traffic might have on an area. And above all, it means development that does not seek to replace what is special in a community, but rather preserve and enhance it. So that we create places that cultivate social cohesion and promote opportunities for neighbours to come together. As Yan Girl has said, only architecture that considers human scale and interaction is successful architecture. Developers need to show that they understand the area in which they seek to build, or otherwise community dissatisfaction and resistance will continue to be an issue. It's true that we need to have a mature whole of society discussion about how we manage growth but we can't put problems down to the NIMBY effect alone. And I've read a recent uh, opinion pieces, including uh, from the Grattan Institute, which go along that vein. They said this, opposition to development is rising again. Unless today's generation of politicians stares down the NIMBYs, Sydney will repeat the mistakes of the past and housing affordability will get worse. Note who's not mentioned in that quote. Government decision makers, NIMBYs being stared down, not actually communities and their views and their engagement. With respect to the Grattan Institute, I think they got that analysis horribly wrong. And the objectives uh, will not be achieved if that's the approach. We need to bring communities with us with change. Increase in densities are certainly possible, and in many cases along public transport routes are absolutely desirable. But it's got to be way, done in a way which can convince people that they will benefit, that their quality of life will be better, not just dismissed in a way like that. We need to do more than just put the responsibility on existing residents to change their behaviour, without also looking at the need for the developer to work with communities and local councils to achieve genuinely good outcomes. It also disregards the sense of pride that people have in place and in their community, which, if anything, we should be looking to harness as we seek to shape future neighbourhoods. It reminds me a little bit of uh, an issue close to my heart that I can say in Melbourne, I think, which was when uh, the Rugby League Commission decided that they could just kick out a football club, South Sydney, and they'll just follow someone else. They just got it wrong. People's identity and who they are is often about where they've grown up, where their parents grew up, 
their connections with that local area. And it simply can't be just dismissed. There's some great examples where development has done well. I'll give two examples from the one corporation. Harold Park in Sydney's inner west is a great example of development done well. There you have an old uh, trotting uh, track uh, and a tram shed, the la latter of which had fallen into disrepair. Mervac worked with councils and the local community, revitalised the site, which today features well-designed, medium-density housing in tree-lined streets. The tram sheds are now home to restaurants and cafes, with the nearby Jubilee Park giving people space to exercise, catch up with friends and family. The same company, Mervac, has experienced the flip side of this, which is with its initial plans to build 28 storeys in towers in Marrickville in an area surrounded by single and double storey homes. Nothing of the kind exists in that area and it's attracted widespread community protests, including from their local representatives. In what has been a PR debacle, every street in South Marrickville has core flute posters which say Marrickville, not Mervacville. That's an example, it's an example of getting it wrong. I'm pleased to say that Mervac have recognised that and are reassessing their plans and looking to involve the community much more closely in any future proposal. It's simple, work with people from the beginning. Don't wait for the response to it. There are lots of ways to make our cities more livable and research suggests that greening them is the key. In addition to combating some of the worst effects of climate change, Green cities can make people happier and healthier. Achieving this, of course, goes beyond just a bricks and mortar approach. I was very pleased to see the focus on green and blue networks in the Western Sydney city deal. As part of this, a blue and green grid will ensure existing waterways across the Hawkesbury catchment area are protected and places of amenity. Urban waterways have so much potential, yet too often are underutilised. Industry located next to our urban waterways because they were seen essentially as uh, free discharge areas with disastrous consequences for our cities. We recently announced here in Melbourne investment in the restoration of Merry Creek, Darabin Creek and the surrounding catchment area. In my own electorate, the Cooks River, uh, which winds its way through the inner west, has been transformed in my lifetime from a place where you wouldn't go anywhere near because the smell made it impossible to one where by now families gather on weekends. So this is a critical issue, but it's not the only one. Around the world, there are a number of innovative ideas aimed at bringing nature into the built space. For instance, in Berlin at the old Tempelhof airport site, urban farms give people living in nearby apartments a chance to tend their own allotment and mingle with others in the neighbourhood. It's a trend that has caught on. Today, Europe's biggest urban farm can be found on the rooftop of a concrete building in The Hague that is also home to a fish farm. Vertical forests in Milan, Singapore and a number of other cities, including Central Park in Sydney, a fantastic development, act as a sponge, absorbing and purifying water before it's reused. Community gardens are multiplying in Australian suburbs. And the end of my street, Marrickville West Public School, has a community garden that's tended to by local volunteers, but also the kids at the local primary school, many of whom don't have backyards. So they get to see where vegetables actually come from. And that has been an enormous success that's being replicated around the country. Smart technology is also enabling greener cities. It plays a dual role maximising the potential of pre-existing assets while identifying new opportunities. It was Shakespeare who wrote, what is a city but the people? Our cities are diverse, complex places steeped in their own history. Each neighbourhood is recognised for its own character. To ensure our cities are productive, sustainable and livable, we must work with people, energising communities to achieve the best possible outcomes. And as our cities continue to grow in size, we must ensure they are places of sustainability, incorporating best practice into their design. 
Greening our cities must be at the heart of our strategy when it comes to dealing with the effects of climate change, ensuring that at the same time, we don't leave our citizens behind. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Anthony. Uh, I thought there's some of those challenges we'll come back to, particularly that challenge you've, you've thrown the industry there. Um, but let's start with population. We've had this population debate break out again, as, as you said in your comments. We've got Tony Abbott lining up with Dick Smith and sort of Bob Carr pretty much saying, let's just stop immigration and all our problems will be right. Uh, where do you line up on, on that? Um, look, the population will continue to grow and the, it, it is very easy, it's an easy response uh, to a real problem. The real problem is urban congestion, people feeling under pressure over a range of issues. Over transport, people can't get on the trains in the peak times. Uh, it's a response to housing affordability issues. Um, but it's a simplistic one and in the end one that won't achieve the outcome that's desired. I'm not against having a population policy. Um, it's a matter of what that is. A population policy should allow for growth, both of our capital cities, but also part of it should be a debate about how do we encourage people to live in our regional cities. Here in Melbourne, they've done it, the Victorian government's been better than most, uh, with uh, Bendigo, Ballarat and Geelong, uh, with uh, the, the encouragement to grow there. Um, but you need, um, you need public transport and you need to have uh, a, a, a city which functions effectively. And I think uh, the response that we've seen, uh, which is immediately attractive in, in the short term, also doesn't recognise some of the benefits of population growth. Uh, one of the things that makes public transport work, of course, is density is the population. Uh, so I, I think you need, you, know, you need both. Uh, you need to have uh, that density, uh, increased density along public transport corridors, but it's gotta be quality, and it's gotta be one that bring, brings the community with it, rather than seeking to be imposed on a community. And uh, I think uh, some of the proposals that are there, for example, on that north-south corridor uh, around the new airport in Sydney is a huge opportunity as a greenfield site yep. to actually get it right yep. from the beginning. It's welcome that there'll be some public transport open at the time of the airport, uh, but it needs to, you, know, you need to at least complete the loop uh, through southwest Sydney to, to Leppington from the airport as well, and then up to St Mary's, uh, which will make a major difference um, you could have uh, there an example whereby uh, people uh, are able to look west or look north or south for where their employment is rather than look towards the CBD. So it's a matter of making sure that you get the planning right, I think, because otherwise the simplistic, um, you know, stop the world, I want to get off position yeah. will be successful. So let's talk about that density done well. You spoke about it in your opening remarks. Uh, the, the, what do you think uh, are the components of density done well? Um, one is to look at um, where employment opportunities are, to look at where the other facilities are in terms of uh, uh, um, education facilities, health facilities and recreational facilities. I think one of the concerns that I've got about the, the growth in some of the cities that's happening at the moment is that for a long time the problem was the creation of drive-in, drive-out suburbs in the, in the outer suburban areas whereby people called for opening up new areas uh, for new housing without thinking about where those people would work, where they'd play, where their kids would go to school, etc. One of the things that's happening now with the infield development is similarly, um, you've added yourself as a constituent uh, of mine, um, the schools in my area are full. Yeah. There are none currently under construction to be built um, in the inner west. I don't know where the kids are gonna go. 
uh, my son went to a local high school that comfortably should have accommodated 500 people. There's over 800 kids there. There's kids in demandables um, in a school that's existed since, um, well, at, at least the beginning of the, the 19th century. Um, it's been there a long time. Um, why is that the case? Um, you know, we need to, to, I think, deal with that. I, I, I think a big issue is um, recreational sporting activities. It's fine for people to have the option of living, um, including families, in, in units. Um, but the kids need somewhere to play even more so than kids who grow up in houses with backyards. Yeah. That's not happening. Uh, and uh, the pressures that are on uh, from, uh, can I say also, from some in the environmental movement who argue, you know, we just want passive space. We don't want kids, you know, because they make noise. Um, drives me crazy as well. Um, we fixed up one of the local ovals and I got this letter of complaint I still have on my wall of, from a woman expressing outrage uh, that now kids could play throughout the whole year. It could be used for football in winter and cricket in summer because when was she going to fly her kite? Um, you know, the, uh, ki kids need to run around and to engage in that social interaction. Um, and, and I think that's a big challenge and I don't see that happening enough. Uh, you can see, um, for those of you familiar, um, people, most people here would fly into Sydney out every now and again. Um, Woolite Creek um, is a massive development. I don't see any new ovals, anywhere new for kids to play there. None. Um, there'll be thousands of kids in, in that area. Um, so issues like that I think will produce a backlash. Yeah. If done properly, uh, with facilities like the example I use very deliberately, the Harold Park development is near a, an oval and near open space. Uh, you need the greening of cities. You need um, to make sure as well that they function. I, I would be very surprised if we don't have you know, wind tunnel issues around Mascot in, in coming years. When you drive along there and have a look at the amount of density without that space in between buildings. Um, you need that. So it's, a, so it's a big challenge you're throwing down because if you look at the numbers, uh, which you know very well, the, the you know, Infrastructure Australia says 75% of our population are going to go into those, just those four big cities, as you said. Um, so for Melbourne or Sydney, they're going to be cities of, you know, of 8 million people you know, by the end of our lifetime. So that's a, that's a New York-sized city. So that's that's, you know, for, for inner areas, for outer areas, for middle ring areas, that's a lot of change. You know, do you think, um, uh, do you think bringing, uh, uh, you know, well, the, the objective of bringing all that social infrastructure, all that hard infrastructure, that's got a tremendous impact on budgets, a tremendous impact on where, uh, where governments at all three levels focus their agendas, hasn't it? It's a bit of a revolution you're talking about. Oh, absolutely. The, 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 the first step to finding a solution is identifying the problem. And part of the problem is that if you look at any individual development or change, you know, it can be okay. So it's okay if one bowling club that's run into disrepair gets bought and dwellings bought, built on it. If the bowling club down the road, that happens as well too, that's less space there. If, if it continually happens along uh, corridors, that, that open space, Canterbury Racecourse is you know, a huge site in, uh, in, in Sydney. Where it's happening, it's next to Canterbury Bowling Club, next to a range of places that essentially have, have uh, fallen uh, ill like a lot of uh, bowling clubs have um, and, and be knocked over. Um, if that happens across the board, and that's why you need government working with the private sector, working with business. Um, it's in um, 
the property accounts I know have a sophisticated position on, on these issues. Um, it's up to individual developers as well as the peak organisations uh, to get ahead of it because the alternative, the alternative is a major backlash yeah. and, and you're starting to see it. Yeah. Um, just like on, on all of these questions, you know, it can feed into those people who will provide easy answers. You know, a few years ago, the problem with urban congestion in Sydney was the refugees on the M4. Um, you know, that person got elected to Parliament mm. um, who, who ran that campaign. You know, we need to get ahead of the debate, be sophisticated about it, and conferences like this are a part of that process, mm. of that dynamic. Um, but it needs to be put into deed as well. Um, and that's where government can play a role uh, as well in terms of ensuring that, that outcomes aren't, you know, individual developers aren't going to do the right thing, so to speak, and take a, you know, a yield of, you know, 100 mil if the place next door is taking a yield of, uh, is making a profit of 150 because they've done the right thing and next door hasn't. Um, there needs to be proper planning and that's why you need uh, a whole strategic approach to planning that includes infrastructure, that includes uh, a role for um, government, not command style economy, I'm not in favour of that, um, but in terms of setting uh, mechanisms and objectives, part of which is the livability of cities, not just the productivity of cities. So let's come back to some of that public policy and we're, we're also getting some questions on the, the, the text line, so that's great. Keep them coming, we'll come to those in a minute. But, but just before we go to that public policy, you know, that, that challenge that you threw down uh, up there was a challenge to policy makers, it was a challenge to the property industry, it was, you know, recognise the communities here. So can we just explore that? So because I, I think that, you know, we quite often have political leaders talk to us and they're talking about public policy, but political leaders play a role, you, you got ears to the ground, that's part of your job. So how angry are they? You know, are they really angry at population growth or are they really angry at those services that they, they don't see? Where's the balance in there? Look, I, I think they're really frustrated about their lot in life, but they're, um, by the experience that they have, you're frustrated if you, you're at the train station and a train's cancelled. You're really frustrated if you're at a train station and a train comes and you can't get on it, uh, which happens. Certainly in Sydney and Melbourne, that happens. Um, so un unless that is dealt with, that frustration can, can be turned very easily to, you know, it's their fault or the solution is to just stop people coming here. Yeah. Um, and, and that will have, you know, incredibly negative consequences, a whole range of issues why we need to uh, continue to have a migration program that attacks, uh, attracts skilled people, attracts young people, fulfills our international obligations with the ageing of the population. Uh, if you have, you know, zero net migration, then that will cause real problems for our economy. Uh, so we need to be prepared to engage in that debate. Uh, about uh, about migration, but need to do it in a way which is sensible. Part of the problem is, uh, as well, dealing from the, the, the bottom up, part of the problem is the amount of uh, red tape, uh, increased costs that are imposed by some local governments yeah. on, on property developers. Uh, there's a role for state government uh, to play in that as well, uh, not to ensure, um, you know, that, that whatever, uh, a sort of laissez-faire, just let it rip. Uh, but, you know, that's part of the consequence of, uh, of, uh, of making sure that you get um, housing affordability as well. I, I'm... I've been amused at sort of stop now that uh, the main proponent of it's moved on, but with 
the government's, you know, I've discovered this new idea called value capture. Developers and local government have been doing it for a very long time, mm. uh, as you know, uh, with some really good examples. And there's some great examples of how uh, that's produced affordable housing, that's produced a, a whole range of, of activities. The affordable housing issue is another one I think that we can work with. I think that the Property Council, Infrastructure Partnerships Australia, there are a range of bodies that have come up with uh, some quite good proposals that will tackle the issue of housing affordability because that is one of uh, the issues. If you want a showstopper, in a focus group of under 30s raise the issue of housing and they're angry. Yeah. Um, you know, dare I say it, there's a bit of a debate at the moment out there you might have noticed about something that most people hadn't heard of, imputation of, uh, and, and, and what that means in terms of intergenerational wealth transfer. Like, <laughs> you know, with respect, uh, you know, some of the issues that have to be target our young people who feel like they missed out on the boat you know I got there I owned my house uh, my generation um, you know benefited substantially uh, but now people feel like they just can't get into the market yeah and they feel like other people us older folk don't care so, so when you're in your electorate or elsewhere in front of in front of uh, the community and you've got people who are very angry, as you say, around housing affordability and a lack of ability to get in. You've got people who have all this angst about social infrastructure, but the cities are still growing. You know, what, 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 what do you say to people? What do you say to the community? And, and what advice would you give to the industry in terms of how they should deal with those, those issues? Industry needs to recognise that it has a social licence to operate. And, and it has the potential to get ahead of the game. We all know, I raised Harold Pub, there's lots of other examples in my area and throughout all of our cities. Uh, Adelaide has some fantastic examples um, in, uh, here in Melbourne also where you have uh, really good uh, development that has really changed and transformed uh, communities that allow for higher density as well, that have quality, uh, that are supported. Um, and I guess it's that for industry is, I think, potentially at a bit of a crossroads. I mean, it's quite interesting in terms of the population debate um, that uh, Dick Smith has been raising that for some time. But the fact that Tony Abbott, who set the current migration numbers, by the way, uh, was prepared to come out and do that, there's a reason why he did that. Yeah. Um, you know, because he sees that as a product differentiator. Um, and Bob Carr's always had that position to be absolutely fair. He's been totally consistent uh, about that, but it does resonate yeah. uh, with uh, a whole range of people um, in the community and it will increasingly be the case unless there's a recognition of you know consulting communities going with them um, people will accept higher densities uh, and and good development if it is good development if they can see that what they know about their local community and the sort of theme of you know energizing um, the debate energizing communities is so critical to, to bring them with uh, them on that task because uh, you know one of the reasons why people live in cities is because the, the nature of density, a agglomeration brings you transport advantages, entertainment advantages, you know the sort of restaurants, cafes, etc only survive and only yep. thrive in a community if there's a lot of people living there uh, you know. And uh, I, th I think people are prepared to go on that journey. I guess if, if I have a message today, it's for um, the business community to be partners in that journey, to not see it as how can we, you know, slip this thing through and uh, 
because in the end it will be counterproductive, perhaps not to the individual, and I, I understand it's very difficult, because to the individual um, is going to make, you know, an individual company that might make a few hundred mil from a, a development, then they're out of there, then, then that's it. But uh, the global or the, the macro result of a group of individual corporations acting in that way will be incredibly negative yep. um, for, for the nation and for the nature of the debate. Um, you know, it's a good thing that when I was announced as, you know, the city's shadow, that, um, you know, we, when we set up the major cities unit, it's a very good thing that the current government um, has uh, a city's minister. Um, it'd be good if they had a city's unit that was independent, but they at least have people who are working on cities um, in uh, back in the department, which is a good thing as well, in the Department of Infrastructure. That's a good thing. That's, that's a victory for people engaged, yep. like yourself and Robbie and, and all the others who've been engaged in this debate for a long period of time. Uh, that shows progress, and it means that you don't have to start at the beginning every few years. Um, Infrastructure Australia is still there. Yes. Um, I think it's been weakened, but it's still there. Um, that's good. It means if there is a change of government, then it will be in a position to, with increased funding, really play a much greater role in, 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 in that planning and coordination. So let's, let's go to that, fast forward, whether it's six months or 12 months, if you won the election and your city's minister as well as infrastructure, what would, be, what would we expect from a, a Labor government around cities policy? What would you do differently than what's being done now? Um, immediately, we would establish a major cities unit, applications welcome, um, and, and we would have, it similarly, be a bit bigger than what we did last time, but you don't need lots of people. You need people who are connected and will engage with the people in this room and everywhere else to drive that policy coordination. Uh, you would have, again, evidence-based policy, so the production of State of Australian Cities reports or the equivalent of examining what's happening in cities at arm's length. You would have it um, under an Infrastructure Australia uh, structure that included, in terms of its board, I appointed Peter Newman, who I think was a very good appointment, but you would have a, a, a you wouldn't have as many farmers on the IA board to be brutal about it. Um, you know, you'd have expertise. There was no politics in the board that I appointed under Sir Rod Eddington um, as chair, but you had, I think, a, a pretty serious body. You look back and you look at a board with Sir Rod Eddington, Mark Birrell, Ken Henry, Kerry Schott, Gary Weaven, uh, Heather Riddout, like it's a serious weight to that board and they listened. It meant everything that went through then just went sailed through the cabinet because you had Prime Minister and Cabinet and you had uh, Terry Moran. Uh, you had people who'd been around the, the, the discussion paper and at arm's length from government. You also had a stream of money behind that, that you know, that they listened Absolutely. because there was money for states to get or not get. Yeah, and a, and a pipeline of projects that, that added up. Regional, regional rail link here in Victoria, um, you know, that transformed existing parts of the city, like Footscray West and Sunshine with new stations, but also had new communities, Tarnit, Wyndham Vale, go there, uh, great examples of new rail stations opening up new suburbs connected by bus and with active transport, bikeways and with lockups, uh, connecting up those local communities before people were there. Um, a great example of how development should happen um, around, uh, around those, uh, those routes and as well um, by separating the lines making it far easier to get to the regional cities of Bendigo, Ballarat and Geelong. And because of that project, uh, the two big projects I think that Melbourne needs, one is Melbourne Metro, um, 
The second is the airport rail link, but through Sunshine, so that it opens up again Ballarat and makes that uh, route in much quicker as well. Um, so that they're the sort of ideas I think you can have. Um, I'm a big fan of high-speed rail. I think when you talk about cities, uh, we've got to talk about not just capital cities, um, but uh, regional cities. Um, high-speed rail will transform Australia's largest inland city as, as Canberra. Canberra's under an hour from Sydney CBD. That, that just changes the whole game yeah. of why national bodies will move from Sydney or Melbourne into Canberra as well. Uh, with uh, with good outcomes, let alone what it would do to Newcastle or Albury Wodonga for that matter and, and cities along that route. So I, I think um, the taking of infrastructure um, seriously in terms of that pipeline of projects as well at arm's length, which is Infrastructure Australia's job to look at the future at the moment, my criticism of the, the current system has been that projects have begun and after they're under construction have got IA approval. Yeah. It's the wrong way around. Yeah. Let's go to some questions now. And we've got, uh, I think, uh, just under 10 minutes remaining. So we'll go to a few in the audience. Uh, if we just keep them short and, and answer short as well so we can get through. So uh, Chris, I think if you just say who you are and where you're from, Chris, so Anthony knows wh where the question's coming from. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Anthony. It's Chris Wheeler. Because we also can't see you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Lucky he's wearing a bright scarf. Must, might just be the light, <laughs> Anthony. Uh, Chris Wheeler from Kingwood Mallisons. Uh, thank you, Anthony, for sharing your time with us. Uh, the coalition is willing that want to see uh, Australia improve. Um, infrastructure. Um, why do we do it so poorly? You will go home um, this evening or the next day or so to land at an airport where fortunately you'll get into a car that'll pick you up, but it'll take you 20 minutes probably to get to the entrance to get out. Um, for mere mortals, there's another half hour wait to get to the taxi before you can actually get out of that airport. Um, and Sydney does a stack of other things really poorly as well. Canberra, my hometown, um, the airport by contrast, it'll take you only 10 minutes to get from the airport to the big house on the hill. So there are pockets that actually do infrastructure very well. But in essence, why does Australia do infrastructure so poorly? I just think we don't do planning very well. Um, we have three tiers of government that often you know, compete with each other or certainly don't coordinate. Uh, when we established Infrastructure Australia, the states didn't go, woohoo, this is great. Um, there was resistance to it. Uh, and when you get ad hoc um, planning, um, then you'll get bad outcomes. You know, there's just near the airport, you know, you'll pass a road project that, you know, um, the tunnel's going to come up somewhere, but they're not sure where all the exit points will be, and they're not sure, um, hasn't been through its final EIS. Um, this isn't a project in planning, this is a project that's been in under construction for four years. You know, literally started digging a tunnel without knowing where the tunnel's coming up. Th it'll be studied as an example of bad planning and therefore hasn't achieved the outcome. It doesn't go to the airport or the port. It's only $17 billion, it's not like it's a big deal. Um, uh, $17 billion is the beginning of the, the cost, I suspect. Um, you know, if I think part of the problem is that the political cycle is three or four years. The infrastructure investment cycle is much longer. Part of the challenge that I have uh, as uh, infrastructure shadow is to get support for something that says, if you agree to this now, someone in seven years' time, we'll get to cut a ribbon. It's a hard challenge to win versus an income tax cut using that $10 billion will hit people's pockets on July 1. Yeah. So part of the challenge is breaking the nexus between the infrastructure investment cycle, which is 
long term and the political cycle, that means you have short termism. And that's a challenge for all of us. Other questions? Yep, Chair. So if you've got another question, you just put your hand up, that way we can queue up a mic for you. Um, I think my question really builds on that last one, this uh, issue of um, getting better um, bipartisan support for infrastructure. Because, I mean, we've seen it in Victoria. Uh, you know, one government plans a particular road, pays a contract, road doesn't happen, um, does planning for a tunnel, and then the other political party looks at saying, how do we block the tunnel? And who, who loses out? We all lose out. And I, I, could you talk a little bit more about how we get to a situation where one government gets credit for doing really good planning and another government gets credit for doing great execution? It seems to happen in other countries, but it doesn't seem to happen here. And it's very sad. Look, I, I think the model the model is two points. One, the model's there, it's Infrastructure Australia. It's having planning done, cost-benefit analysis that's published a pipeline of projects there with NICS National Infrastructure Construction Schedule available online for everyone to see any project about $50 million, what it is. Um, and to give you some hope, the example of projects that had been built that would never have been built without that process because there's no votes in it for various reasons. Majura Parkway in the ACT, Hunter Expressway in uh, $1.7 billion Hunter Expressway, Majura Parkway, uh, $288 million road, both of which major freight benefits, strong BCR, but no seats changed hands because of that. Um, yeah, under construction, Goodwood to Torrens rail freight line in South Australia, uh, probably cost votes because the train lines are noisy, um, particularly freight lines through suburbs, but much more efficient. So there are examples of where it has worked. Um, the other example of something part of, you can make a difference from opposition, I found as well. Um, Badgers Creek Airport would not happen without government and opposition supporting it. The reason why it hadn't happened, um, the reason why it wasn't announced by the former government was because Tony Abbott wouldn't agree to it. That's the truth. Joe Hockey signed off, other people signed off, all the planning was done. It's so easy to say no and to run a campaign. Um, it needs people to say yes to good planning. I mean, that's an example of you know, a project being planned to death. Um, but it is also an example of good planning and that the reason why it will be a success, why you can minimise noise, do all that, was that the reservations were put there in, in the 1980s by the Hawke government. And, and that has made a major, um, major difference as well. So I, I think it can be done. It requires people in politics to show leadership and to do the right thing. It also requires, though, pressure from civil society to do the right thing uh, as well, to, to campaign and to be a, a part of uh, that process. Hunter Expressway wasn't quite like the, the, the airport, but it was planned and needed from the 19, late 1970s it was first talked about. I'll give you a, a, a worse one. Redcliffe Rail Line was promised in 1895 in the Queensland Parliament. It was promised, the government promised it, it's now open and part of the problem that we had, I think we had four launches of the bloody project because no one believed it was gonna happen. Um, but it took all three levels of government uh, to get it done and to you know, start the construction. Otherwise it would have been stopped like the other projects were stopped, like Melbourne Metro, Cross River Rail and the other rail projects were stopped with the change of government. Yes to good planning. 
uh, where the responsibility not just for, for government but on all of us. So I think that's something we can all vote for. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Anthony Albanese. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again to the best credentials cities champion in our federal parliament, Anthony, and our very own cities champion, Ken. Please thank them again as they depart. And now, at last, I understand, after the appropriate sacrifices have been made, the gods of technology have chosen to reunite us with Davina from Stockland. Woo! <laughs>
Two more thanks. Uh, a warm display of appreciation, please, to our outstanding national and international guest speakers over the last two days. It's been wonderful. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, to our friends from Consol, the Hyatt, and of course our wonderful organising teams uh, from the Property and Green Building Councils, a very warm vote of thanks too. Whenever I see Rom on the move, I get nervous, so that was a bit distracting. The penultimate housekeeping alert. Uh, please note that the networking lunch will, now, will be served after this, this wrap with Rom and Ken in the residence, which is located out the back doors there, around to the left. And this is your last opportunity, obviously, to see our sponsors' displays, but also you're welcome to stay until about 2.30 uh, to stay and enjoy that lunch. And before that, when we leave, the redoubtable Brian Long, who's the Group Head of Sustainability and Safety for Lend Lease, will share a few of his closing thoughts by video on what an energised community looks like. But that will all come after our Chiefs do the ceremonial wrap-up. Ken, are you waiting in the wings there? I am. <laughs> it's a bit like having Darth Vader announce himself at the back of the stage there. That might have been a, a previous Chief of the Property Council. Ken and Rom, please give them a great big round of applause. <laughs> They're looking good. They've come to the final lap of the marathon here. We've had a jam-packed few days replete with emerging ideas, trends and technologies, and also some common sense revelations that invigorate the possibility of what is possibly an overstretched notion of sustainable cities. Ron, would you care to start with your observations of the last two days? Sure. Well, the first thing I want to say is you as an industry and all our international um, partners and GBCs are fantastic and you make what we do fulfilling and worthwhile and I think everyone should be really proud of what we've achieved, what we've discussed uh, and debated and you know nothing seems to have phased or worried you about how we try and challenge you which is our aim around transformation. Um, the three things that I'll be looking at is nature, health and social um, sustainability and I think there's been some fantastic discussion over the past few days. Um, looking at nature, I think all of us were blown away. There's been a number of discussions around nature, finishing off with Anthony Albanese talking about it as well. And uh, as, as technology accelerates, we need to bring more nature into our cities. We've had some fabulous speakers, Pas Pascal Mittermeier, uh, Jackie and Jamie Jury uh, talked about uh, the importance of nature and that it's more than one pot plant. And if you go to the women's toilets, there is just one pot plant in there. Uh, I then pulled it out to make sure it was real, with a lot of women laughing at me. Um, Jackie talked about that if you have more than f five plants, that el helps increase workplace satisfaction by 75%. But Pascal really uh, sounded the alarm bells when he said, if most young people uh, are in nature for 30 minutes each week, how will that influence the way they sh reshape cities? And finally, if you missed it, go and see Roger Swinburne. Green Infrastructure, ACOM, they have uh, released this and it's available. So I've given a whole lot of copies to Nick, but Roger's mm -hmm. got a stack as well. Moving on to health, I think what uh, the discussion we had yesterday with Lucy Brogdon about mental health was really, really important and that it is more than just yoga and a fruit plate. Uh, and the conversation she said around, the point that she made around, if someone doesn't believe there's mental health in the workplace, then they're kidding themselves. So it really is important to, to take that issue seriously and that we shine a light on it um, and putting people back in the centre of our urban design. And finally, social sustainability. Frankie, congratulations to you. You have driven this. This is a really important report, the common language for social sustainability. Uh, it's wonderful how you engage with the industry. It's fantastic having you as part of our industry and you bringing us all together and challenging us. And I think uh, the fact that it's appropriate that you launch that here. Um, for those of you who missed the Indigenous um, Reconciliation Breakfast this morning, wow, there are no words. I mean, it was just fantastic. But Andrea Mason, uh, who's from uh, the Northern Territory, used the term operating rhythms, which look at land, law, language and family. And I think it's uh, really important that we really immerse their culture into the design of our cities and do it in a respectful and meaningful way. And there was a lot of discussion about that. And if you missed it, just follow my tweets. I've given them all their hints. 
that they said, but we really do need to understand what all members of community want. Um, and so finally, I'm going to quote Sc Scott Langford, who said, property has the ability to shape great places for everyone. Thank you. And Ken. So three things for me, Mike. One is innovation, and you, 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 know, you sit through these sessions, you see these great speakers, you listen to the fantastic ideas, and you just know there's no shortage of innovation in, in this industry, which is absolutely fantastic because it's a, it's a testament to how far we've come. But when you look at the future, there's a hell of a lot to do, and we're gonna need all that innovation and more. So that's, that's fantastic and really inspiring to, to, to be a part of and to see. The second thing is advocacy. So we've had a fantastic political footprint at this, at this Green Cities, which is great. But you know, reflecting on yesterday's discussions, you know, the climate wars, well, they're still, they're still not stopped. Everyone's agreeing that we should have consensus, but we haven't yet got consensus. Uh, and for the built environment, you know, we've been you know, really pushing our way into a lot of offices and rooms over the last couple of years. Uh, for a political environment that's sort of not yet ready to listen to us. And I think our time's coming there. They're, they're starting to tune in more to the need to look at demand management. They're starting to tune in more to the fact that there's a quarter of Australia's emissions sit within the built environment and they've got to do something about that and that there's a willing partner, uh, partners there to work with. Uh, and and the, third, the third takeaway is around net zero and uh, which is a piece of work, obviously, the Green Building Council's doing, charting out a pathway for what the industry's got to do in terms of transitioning. Um, uh, you know, governments signed on to Paris, we've got lots of commitments and action, but have we really got the transformational reform agenda to get us there? And I think the answer to that's no. So, you know, for me, where we sit now um, we sit from a lot of strengths, but it sort of feels like a quite a seminal, mo seminal moment at the moment. You know, the, definitely around the, the 2000 Olympics was a seminal moment. The, you know, had a, uh, uh, an awakening of this industry around the need to really pile into sustainable development in a strong way. Of course, that's when the Green Building Council was established. Um, uh, and this feels like another one of those moments that the industry has got to grab and take and, and, and coalesce with political leaders along as well. Very good, very good. Did you, did you want to add anything to that or would you like to wrap? I think we should wrap and everyone's way too it's, much. it's pithy, it's been punctual. Obviously, there's a lot of consensuses that we need to build, consensi, is that, <laughs> is that doable, consensi? There are a lot of gaps to close uh, and, and clearly we have a role in helping governments and I think all of the powerful people that have been on this stage in the last couple of days have recognised the strength of this unity ticket here on the stage. They come here because they want to engage with you all and they want, I think they are looking for a roadmap themselves in many ways. So that transformation agenda that you're both talking about is something that we can, as an industry, help with. Um, I will ask you to show your appreciation, not yet, but in a moment after this. We did just want to end by quoting um, that treasure of the human world, Stephen Hawking, no longer on this fragile blue planet of ours. But he said many wonderful things, and this was just one of them, which sort of goes to the heart of what I think drives a lot of people in this room today. He said, I've been enormously privileged through my work to be able to contribute to our understanding of the universe, but it would be an empty universe indeed if it were not for the people I love and who love me. We are all time travellers journeying, journeying together into the future, but let us all work together to make that future a place we want to visit. So thanks to Rom and Ken, here you are all thinking and working, hopefully to make the future a better place and uh, a place that we and our loved one, ones want to visit. And on that note, uh, would you please join with me in thanking our two very kind co-hosts, Rom and Ken, one final time. And on that note, we will see you next year at Green Cities. Thank you very much and enjoy yourselves at lunch. Just one last thing before, before we, we close. Oh. We can thank uh, two sets of people. Firstly, if we can thank all the people from the Green Building Council team, the Property Council team who do so much work, yes, these couple of days, but also in the, the months uh, previous, 
uh, and also Mike Zorbis for once again being our MC extraordinaire. So if we could. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. An energised community is one where people are given a real voice and a genuine opportunity to co-create. An energised community is also an inclusive community and one where people can reach their full potential. They can do this through active and two-way social participation, opportunities around skilling, education and employment, and benefiting from positive environmental and human health outcomes. At Lendlease, Having energized communities is at the heart of us creating the best places. Enjoy Green Cities, everyone. <laughs>